Hi, I'm Dr. Michael Calderwood, Chief Quality Officer here at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center. I'm gonna spend the next 20 to 25 minutes talking about COVID-19 with some updates for patients, staff, the community, and members of the press. And we're really gonna focus on uh, common questions that we've been receiving. There will be a time at the end where I can uh, come to questions that we are having submitted. So I wanna uh, welcome you all to submit those questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can. I do wanna start with a, a brief update for folks of where we are uh, both here uh, in the United States and then more locally in New Hampshire. Um, over the past week, there have been an average of 77,000 new cases of COVID-19 reported daily in the United States. That is up about 25,000 from where we were on a daily basis a month ago. And similarly in New Hampshire, we're seeing our number of cases increase back to where we were around Thanksgiving. And so while we had reached a new low in mid-March, cases have been on the rise and we've seen about a doubling up until about a week ago. And we are beginning to see things uh, show some improvement and we're hoping that that trend will continue. In terms of hospitalizations here in New Hampshire, we've also seen a doubling and so we are up to around 130 uh, patients who are hospitalized with COVID-19 across the state. And this is something that's being closely monitored uh, to understand which direction that is going. Thankfully though, we have not yet seen an increase in the number of deaths from COVID-19 back to where we were when we were hitting our peak in January of 2021. What we are seeing, however, is that those who are being most impacted in terms of cases and hospitalizations are shifting towards younger age groups that have a um, lower rate of vaccination. And this highlights the fact that we need to really think about what we can do to keep ourselves and our community safe. So many have heard that New Hampshire has um, lifted the statewide mask mandate as of last week. But I wanna remind folks that all cities within New Hampshire and many towns, as well as many businesses, continue to um, advocate for masks and mandate in many cases, masks. We're all frustrated that this pandemic is not over and we want to remove our masks, but if we remove our masks too early and we don't maintain that physical distance from others, it's only going to prolong our fight. So what can you do? We're getting more and more people vaccinated. We can gather in homes with others who are vaccinated. We can remove those masks in private residences as long as those around us feel comfortable. We do have to recognize that people have a different level of comfort. And so you may gather with some who still want those masks on and we have to respect their wishes. What this means is that we often will go into a home wearing a mask and see what others are doing. If we have conversations, everyone's been vaccinated, we feel comfortable, we can take those masks off. As we go out into the community, we have to think about indoor environments where we don't have um, a lot or as good ventilation as we may in an outdoor environment. Can we physically distance from others? And when we can't, can we wear a mask to protect ourselves and others? And this will be particularly important as we go into the summer. We're going to begin to see things like sporting venues and uh, fairs that are opening up. And it's exciting that we're at a point where we actually can begin to think about re-engaging in a lot of these activities. But these are times where we're going to have a prolonged exposure to others and so we want to think about that mask as a key part of our defense. We need to remember, as has been spoken about by many, that none of the vaccines are 100% effective. And while those who are vaccinated are much less likely to become severely ill to the point where they require hospitalization or die from this illness, they can still transmit to others. We are hearing about 
cases of breakthrough infections, often with people who have milder symptoms, don't always know that they are carrying the virus and are out and about in the community. And so that mask is an added layer as we think about what we can do to protect others before we have a higher percentage of our population that's vaccinated. Currently, the New Hampshire Medical Society is urging individuals, communities, schools, and businesses to really to continue to advocate for mask use until we at least achieve 70% of our population that is fully vaccinated. At the same time, we wanna to begin to see that our community rates of infection are on the decline. And I mentioned earlier, we have in the past month been seeing an increase. Where are we now? If we look across the United States, 33% of adults 18 and older are fully vaccinated within New Hampshire, that is 35%. So that is a great start, but it's only halfway to that number of 70% that we need to achieve before we can really begin to say we can back off on a lot of the things that have been keeping us safe. So what I will say is that for all who can, getting vaccinated is both highly encouraged and for many should be considered a civic duty. This is really what we need to get to the point where we can end this pandemic. A lot of questions about the safety of vaccines continue to come up. I think it's important to recognize that at this point, we have given over 200 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines to over 130 million people. And that number is increasing every day. We are getting incredible amounts of safety data. This is tracked very closely by the CDC. You can go on their website and actually look um, and find in real time data on what is being reported. We know that significant side effects are extremely rare and each one of these is investigated. In fact, we recently had a pause on the J&J &J vaccine after six individuals developed a rare form of blood clotting. We need to understand though, that this was six individuals out of close to 7 million doses of the J&J &J vaccine. So this was less than one in a million in terms of the risk of that side effect. I wanna highlight for folks that it is much riskier to actually get illness from COVID-19. Amongst those that fall ill from this virus, we know that one out of every five has a risk of blood clotting. Some of these very severe, including things like stroke in individuals at a young age. The CDC and others have been looking at the data and we expect that by later this week, we will have further guidance on the use of the J&J &J vaccine, and we expect that we will begin giving this vaccine to some potentially as early as next week based on that guidance. Moderna and Pfizer vaccinations do continue at this time, and in fact, Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center is now one of the places where you can sign up to be vaccinated. And then before I go to the questions, I do, I wanna acknowledge that we probably are only at the beginning of the impact of this virus. We are beginning to learn that 10 to 30% of people who recover from COVID-19 report lingering symptoms that can at times last more than 12 weeks. These can be things like shortness of breath, rapid heart rate, body aches, fatigue, and brain fog amongst others. And from some, these symptoms are mild, but for others, they can be debilitating. And so Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center is, is launching a clinic for those with post-acute COVID syndrome, sometimes referred to as long-haul clinic or long-haul COVID. Um, more information on this clinic is available on our website, and we will provide uh, emails and phone numbers for you uh, who are interested and your primary care providers can access that if that would be helpful for you as individuals. We continue to learn about this virus, about post-COVID-19 symptoms, and these types of care centers are gonna be really important as we think about our comprehensive and coordinated approach to COVID-19 
aftercare. So I do see that we have some questions, and I'm going to uh, answer those. Um, we, the first question is about what is the right percentage of the population that needs to be vaccinated? And there is a not, there's not a perfect number. A lot of people talk about herd immunity, and we've heard people talk about 70% and 80%. The actual percentage is based on two things. It's based on the effectiveness of the vaccine that people are getting. And so as we see new variants, some of these vaccines might become slightly less effective. That's why we need to get more and more people vaccinated as quickly as we can. The second is viruses tend to transmit uh, to more people, depending on which variant you're looking at. And so if you have a variant where you're going to infect more people, you need to have more people vaccinated. We're using 70% as the number that we want to get to. And so that is really what we are trying to achieve. And we think at the current rates of vaccination, we can be there by early summer. But again, that requires that all who have access to a vaccine step forward and get their shot. Another question is, I'm already fully vaccinated. Why do I still need to have a COVID test before surgery, uh, when being admitted to a, a hospital. And this is something that we're actually looking at quite closely. Um, and so we know that amongst those that have had pre-procedural testing, your chance of having a positive test drops significantly after being vaccinated. At the same time, we know that you may not have the same symptoms. And we're going to bring you into an environment where you may undergo a procedure where we can aerosolize some of that virus or put you in a room with others who are ill. And we wanna make sure we're doing everything we can to protect others in the community and to make sure that you are going through a procedure where you're not gonna have an adverse outcome because of a virus you didn't know that you had. Third question is, if all of the adults in our house are vaccinated but the kids are not, What's the biggest risk to our household at this time regarding COVID-19? It's a question that we get a lot. And so what I will say to that is we know that children are much less likely to end up with severe illness, to be hospitalized, uh, to die. Um, and so we actually um, uh, have had uh, no deaths uh, under the age of 20. What we are uh, really focused on is thinking about transmission to others uh, in the household. And so um, as we're thinking about what we can do locally versus regionally and across the country, those conversations are slightly different. If you're choosing to gather with another family in your home, do folks all need to wear masks? Some people may have a conversation and feel the adults were all vaccinated which is a small gathering, no, we do not. Now, that's a different conversation if you're talking about going to a theme park, traveling on a vacation. We need to think about those risks, particularly if you're then returning and going to schools, participating in sports, and thinking about what that could mean for transmission to others. Fourth question is, is the J&J &J vaccine safe for people with a um, mutated gene? Um, they don't specify what the mutated uh, gene is. Um, we know that uh, the clotting that is being seen um, is similar uh, to um, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, or HIT. Um, and so they're looking at the genetics of that. Again, it's a very small number. And so they're looking at all sorts of different uh, risk factors to identify commonalities. Um, so at this time, I can't answer specifics about any mutated gene. Next question is, is it safe to fly? And so um, again, it is safe to fly. You have to think about uh, what you do to keep yourself safe. And so I continue to advocate that all who are on uh, planes continue to uh, wear a mask, uh, both going into the terminal, going through 
uh, check-in and security while waiting for your plane. Those are actually probably the highest risk periods uh, in the busy terminal. Uh, on the plane, because of the air handling, it's actually a lower risk. We know that on planes, uh, people take off masks uh, to eat and drink. And so it's important to uh, realize that there will be times when those masks are off, but we're trying to limit uh, the amount of time uh, that that occurs. Some people on planes are choosing to wear two masks or to wear uh, an N95. We don't know if that is uh, actually uh, more protective. Um, we think that two masks may provide a slightly higher level of protection if others around you are not wearing a mask, and that's why some choose to do that. If everyone's wearing a mask, a single mask is effective. The bigger thing, rather than just the airplane, is thinking about when you're traveling, who are you engaging with? And we tend to be more social in our travels, and we eat out more often, and we go to larger events, and we want to think about what we can do to protect ourselves in terms of physical distancing, in terms of masking uh, when we're around others. And that's it in terms of the questions that we're receiving. So I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you today. Um, please continue to visit our website, dh.org, for the most up-to-date information to stay informed. Take care. Good day.